Thanks for coming. I'm told I have to speak at the microphone at the podium, so can't walk around. That would be bad for the audience at home. Uh, we're here uh, at this breakout session to talk about social media uh, strategies and tools for advocacy campaigns. So if you're in the right room, thanks for coming. Uh, we know you have a choice of airlines. So. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce folks in a second here, but um, let me just give you like a five-second intro to who I am. I'm J.D. Laska. I run socialbright.org. We're a social media consultancy for nonprofits. Uh, but also, you know, we do a lot of social good stuff. So I um, spoke at the United Nations a couple of months ago to NGOs about how to use social media f uh, to combat global poverty, uh, that sort of thing. So this is part of our circuit of going around to different organizations and, and groups uh, because we really admire what you guys do. So thank you, first of all, for all the good work that you're doing back in your home countries. Um, uh, this is, of course, Internet at Liberty. Um, and uh, I will tell you that our Twitter hashtag, of course, is Internet Liberty. Um, this is a screenshot of the Magna Carta. Perhaps we're in need of a Magna Carta for the online world. We'll probably be discussing that over the next couple of days. Um, so feel free to tweet us. You know, we do not, do not mind if you uh, multitask and listen and tweet at the same time. Uh, in fact, we welcome that. Uh, here are the people that are going to be talking uh, this afternoon. Uh, uh, I guess, you know, why don't we ask people to stand up as, as I introduce them. Uh, so Sana Salim from Bolo B. Is that how to, how to pronounce it? Okay. Or close enough. Or is it by? Bolo by? Bolo B. Bolo B. Okay. Uh, Oscar Morales who's going to be talking about the FARC campaign in uh, Colombia. Uh, Jim Murphy from Human Rights Watch. We also have Enrique in the room over there. Hi, Enrique. Uh, Darcy Lunn from uh, Global Poverty Project. Uh, Matt Peralt from Facebook. Where's Matt? Hey, Matt. And uh, Jason Karsh from Google Plus. Can you stand up? Oh, there he is. Yeah. OK, thanks, Jason. Um, and so uh, let me explain how this is going to work. Um, we're, we're doing something pretty ambitious today. You know, there's so much to cover in terms of social media, right? Uh, how can you possibly uh, compact it down into like 90 minutes? There, there, there are conferences that go on for three or four days just on the subject of social media, right? But we also want this to be not just us talking at you. So we want this to be as inclusive a 90 minutes as possible. So what we'd like to do is spend the first 30 minutes uh, talking about uh, campaign strategies and the different kind of platforms out there. I'm going to start, you know, we'll see how this works now. So I'm going to like, talk for 10 minutes, uh, go through this presentation, uh, talking about different kinds of campaign strategies, talking about the three major platforms we're going to be talking about today, Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. And then we're going to get to the breakout sessions, uh, the fun part, and this is where it gets much, much more interactive. And so we're going to form four different groups, um, and so this is how it's supposed to work in theory. We're going to have like, uh, like a couple of tables join up. So there'll be like a Facebook table, a Twitter table, a Google Plus table, and uh, another tools uh, table that I'm going to lead. Um, so uh, Matt from Facebook and Jason uh, from Google Plus. Um, and I guess Jim is going to have to lead the Twitter session because nobody from Twitter is here, right? Is anybody from Twitter? No. Um, so that's how it's going to work. And then after 25 minutes of that, we're going to break again and then go to a different group. You can stay with your original group if you want, but we're sort of trying to, you know, cover as much ground as we can. Um, so these, and I'll explain how the, the breakout sessions are going to work, but basically it's um, one person who's going to facilitate and then another person who's going to be like a co-facilitator. Um, and, you know, you guys are basically going to be sharing knowledge, sharing anecdotes or stories or tales of success or failure, and, you know, uh, sharing your stories about what's working or not working with social media, especially with regard to these four different uh, platforms or sets of tools. So does that, you know, that just confuse, like, totally everybody, or does that make sense? Okay, all right. Uh, so we'll talk more about how that's going to work. And then at the end, we'll save 10 minutes. Everybody, you, you know, you'll designate one person from your group to sort of be the guinea pig to stand up and tell all the great learnings that came out of your breakout session to share with the entire group. All right. So that's how it's going to work. And then, of course, if there's time for hugs and terrible goodbyes, we'll do that. Um, and one thing to uh, just tell you is, you can all take a deep breath. You know, you don't have to take a million notes. Uh, first of all, this presentation is already online. 
Um, your one bit of homework today is write down this URL, um, since there's not really a conference website, right? So uh, we created a, basically a, a new section of our site at SocialBright, uh, socialbright.org slash advocacy toolkit uh, with a hyphen in there, uh, you know, for those who can't see the, the screen in the back. Um, and uh, we launched it today. Uh, so this is what I've been doing up until like 2 o'clock in the morning the last few nights, getting this all together. Um, and you'll also notice that um, part of the toolkit uh, goes into real specificity with regard to platforms and tools for social good. Uh, so one thing we want to make sure that you all do before you leave is grab some of these uh, flyers that are on the central table over there. Uh, Google was kind enough to print out these really nicely done color flyers that really go into detail around um, monitoring tools and metrics tools and fundraising tools. Um, and, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff, like I said, under the tool, you know, the umbrella of social media. Uh, but we try to condense it down so that we're not spending like 90 minutes just talking about this tool or that tool because we really want to just sort of get the intelligence of the room together to sort of elevate the discussion, to talk about best practices, what's working, you know, with, with your own campaigns, what kind of barriers that you're facing, and then, sh you know, we can sort of troubleshoot that in these smaller circles, right? Um, but when you go back to your home countries or your home states, um, feel free to share these uh, handouts, these flyers, uh, these resources with your teams. Um, all of these resources are online, downloadable, freely shareable, under Creative Commons licenses. All right, so I'm going to do my uh, five-minute blast that I usually take half a day with uh, about social media. So, um, you know, f I've been talking about social media since 2005, and it's kind of nice that we've come so far. They don't really have to explain much about what social media is. You know, when I started off, you know, it, it was like I was going to these rooms and people were saying, what is this social media of which you speak? You know, I don't know what you mean. Um, and now it's burgeoned into this uh, growing global movement, right? So all these different kinds of examples of social media, from blogs to Facebook and Twitter to the newest uh, shiny toy of, uh, of Pinterest. Um, my, my point in showing this is that um, don't do all of this, you know. Don't do all of this. You will go crazy. You know, you don't have to have uh, virtual worlds that you're a part of, or you don't have to do, you know, forums or presentation sharing. If you do it, cool, you know, you're doing social media. But you want to just identify the, you know, two or three platforms and uh, tool sets that make the most sense to accomplish your goals and your mission, right? Um, so um, we're all in this room today because we know uh, the amazing things that are happening out there around the world with social media today, right? Um, um, 150 million blogs, um, all these sites that you all know of that I don't have to go into with any kind of detail. There are also the smaller kind of uh, social networks happening uh, organically in these different regions of the world. I just f came across uh, a listing of about 20 different social networks in South Africa the other day. Um, I'm sure you can educate us about some of the, the ones that are happening in your corner of the woods. Uh, Twitter is still growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, Google Plus, I hear, is on track to reach 400 million users by the end of the year. Uh, YouTube is just uh, totally insane, 200,000 videos being watched every minute of the, of the day around the world. Uh, YouTube now accounts for 10% of all the traffic on the Internet, and that's expected to go up as more and more people use video uh, for their social media. Um, and uh, I just threw in this last thing about 8 trillion text messages sent last year because uh, scientists estimate that my teenage son sends approximately 50% of them. <coughs> Um, so um, one of the handouts actually uh, shows 10 uh, steps you need to take for a successful advocacy campaign. And we don't have time to go through all 10 during this session, but at my table we'll, we can go into more depth about some of the details of these different things. But um, I did want to sort of uh, suggest that, um, and you know, feel free to you know, raise your hand and disagree, that a lot of these kinds of organizational uh, uh, tasks um, around creating a successful advocacy campaign can be boiled down to three different buckets. One is you have to start with the right message, right? You have to have, you have to identify what it is that you're trying to spread um, and have a message that's compelling enough 
a sort of a shareable object in social media is what we call it, that other people are going to care about it uh, genuinely and want to be part of that campaign and spread it for you on your behalf. You can't broadcast everything out from your central hub, right? You've got to enlist the community to be your evangelists, your, your supporters on your behalf, right? So you want to inspire people. You want to create content. Um, you want to learn how to um, to move people to take action, and that means appealing to them emotionally. Um, so you're trying to craft that kind of shareable content. Uh, the second thing is building that community. Don't think of uh, people out there as your audience. You know, I think words are important. So you're trying not to build uh, audiences or to uh, uh, reach more eyeballs. You're trying to build community, and it could be a set of communities, but it, it's got to be people who are – you're trying to enlist as supporters, move them up the ladder of engagement into becoming uh, uh, evangelists and champions for your cause. Um, so you're trying to turn them into champions. Um, there are lots of tactics for doing that. And the last thing is uh, the media part of this. So um, first of all, I think uh, it's important to say that the most important social media campaigns that I've seen is when they're coupled with their traditional media outreach. So getting you know, the major newspapers or the broadcast television or radio stations to carry your message as well and supplement that and amplify that through social media. Um, and then also to think of this as like an entire ecosystem, right? So you're not just using Twitter, you're not just using Facebook or Google+, Plus, but you're sort of integrating this into some kind of a line strategy where you have a website or a central conversation hub, um, you have other conversations on Facebook, you make other announcements or engage in other conversations on Twitter, uh, but you don't necessarily just use those as separate silos. You sort of point from one platform to the other. You know, you, you go to where it makes most sense for you to have a conversation about a certain thing or a question that you have of your, of your community. So just figure out with your team what makes most sense to use, what social media tool to, to use, and then go from there. All right, I'm almost done. Uh, Facebook, we haven't talked about that uh, so much. Um, um, I call Facebook, I'm sorry, uh, I call Facebook the uh, uh, freak show of social media um, because it's just crazy. You know, one out of eight people on the planet have used uh, s Facebook in some way over the last 30 days. Um, uh, Fifty-seven percent of global members use it uh, every single day. Uh, you know, I think they're probably on track to uh, crack a billion soon. Um, and... Uh, it's important to think about different ways of using Facebook. One is, um, and, and we can talk about Facebook tactics and strategies and how you guys are using Facebook in your own campaigns at the Facebook circle that we're going to be breaking into in a couple of minutes. Um, but I wanted to mention just a couple of things. One is, uh, how many people know about secret groups on Facebook? So about a third of you. So for the other two-thirds, uh, you can create a secret group, and that might be really important for your advocacy campaign if it involves any kind of uh, human rights or um, controversial uh, po political content uh, that the government might, might be interested in. Uh, sort of trying to prevent you from, or, or trying to spy over your shoulder. I don't know 100% how secure Facebook secret groups are from, like, you know, the NSA. Who knows? Um, but for for our purposes, you know, they're secret in the sense that, you know, they're not spidered by any search engine. They're only open to the people that you invite into them. So I've used it with a number of our clients, and they find it really, like, almost the most effective way of communicating with different kinds of groups. I mean, do you agree, you know, the Facebook groups is an effective way to do that? Yeah, I think it's more protective, but it's not ultimately protective. So I think yeah. assume that you're going to be definitely safe and it could be a false assumption. Okay. Certainly, obviously, more safe than it would be. No. That's right. Um, so... Okay, good. And we'll talk more about that during the breakouts. All right. And the other, the one last thing I wanted to mention about Facebook is um, 
you know, I go to a lot of different groups and we talk about Facebook and everybody thinks, oh, I got, you know, 5,000 likes. So all these 5,000 people are seeing all of my updates. Well, no, that's not how it works, right? You have to uh, be in people's news feeds, right? So there are 900 million front pages of Facebook, right? If you think about it, it's like a marvel of technology. I'm still amazed at how Facebook works. Um, so people don't jump from, you know, page to page to page. They look at their news feed. So you've got to get into that news feed. And how you do it? You do it through engagement. So 2011, I think, was all about likes. And I think 2012 was all about engagement. So Facebook uh, Insights re-engineered itself a few months ago to become more of an engagement engine of letting you know how are people actually using your materials. Are they sharing it? Are they talking about it? Are they commenting on it? Are they uh, putting on other platforms? And um, if you really want to get depressed, uh, there's a URL, edgerankchucker.com. Uh, type in the URL of your Facebook page. It will spit back a score at you in about 60 seconds. And it will probably be a score under 5 on a scale of like 1 to 30, I think, right? Um, and um, I'm saying to do that just because you need a baseline to see if the kinds of things you're doing on Facebook over time is going to be improved and then numbers can start creeping up as more and more people start engaging with you. Um, all right, I was told I, I, I need to talk about Twitter for a second because nobody from Twitter is here. Um, Twitter, 150 million users, 70% of them are outside the U.S. Um, it comes in 22 uh, uh, flavors. Uh, see if your flavor is up there or not. Um, and you can do a lot of things uh, on Twitter. Uh, one thing is to uh, interact with heads of state and heads of government. Uh, one out of five uh, uh, heads of state around the world are now using Twitter, and you can find them, um, you know, through this presentation and, and elsewhere. Do a, do a search. Um, one thing I wanted to emphasize is I think a lot of people uh, make the mistake of letting Twitter come to them. You know, they start getting overwhelmed by their Twitter feed. It's like um, I can't follow any more people because I'm just deluged by this, you know, drench of stuff coming at me. So uh, two things. One is make sure you use some kind of uh, uh, online tool like Hootsuite, um, H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com or your favorite uh, Twitter um, client uh, to break down that uh, torrent of tweets into manageable sizes to the most relevant uh, streams that are relevant to your cause or your, your campaign. And the second thing is to take advantage, you know, I, I still can't believe uh, how many people don't know or take advantage of advanced search on Twitter. So if you go to tw uh, search.twitter.com and you type in uh, the name of the city that you're most concerned with, like your, your capital of your country, under places, and then you set a distance, you can see all the tweets that are coming out of there, and you can even sort by language, um, on a particular kind of subject. So here are all the people within 50 miles of Tokyo tweeting about freedom. You know, so you can do this with anything, any keyword, any any one of your causes. So don't just think that you can only manage your Twitter stream by looking at the torrent that's coming in. Be more focused and strategic, and uh, use it. You know, uh, use it smartly, right? All right. Uh, Jason is going to introduce Google Plus. Uh, so why don't you say why don't you come up here? Because uh, we're we're recording this. We have got a little video to show too. How's it going, guys? So I figured that a lot of people who've been using Google+, Plus, we've seen that they take their Twitter or Facebook posts, repost it to Google, and they don't find that much success there. So I thought it might be useful to get a, a sense through a, a, a admittedly sort of marketing video um, to let's get a look at some of the features, particularly Hangouts, and then I'm going to talk about uh, Google+, Plus in Search in a second. Technical difficulties. Good. We're not hearing anything. Is there a tech guy in the room? <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you don't. I don't want to stall it, so we can. All right, let's go to the next uh, slide for a second. Um, talk about Google Plus in general terms. Um, yeah, so basically what, what the video highlights is Hangouts have really kind of exploded. It's a 10-person video chat that we've just allowed you to broadcast on air. So someone who's not 
a member of Google+, Plus, can still click onto the YouTube or a live stream embedded into your website and see a 10-person video chat. We've seen it be really successful with, with celebrities, influencers, and getting them in the rooms with donors, volunteers, fans, etc., and then being able to see these live interactions and take a fundamentally social experience between a few people and broadcast it to the masses. Also, in search, uh, if you link your, your plus page to your website, you'll also have an ability to influence uh, how you appear in search by having your profile appear on the right-hand side and have the latest posts, if you post a lot, come up on the right-hand side. So that's okay. basically okay. in a nutshell. And the video is not online, though, right? Uh, so it's not. We're not going to be able to see it later. All right. Well, come over to my computer. Guess window, what? So. Oh, wait. We are now on Google+. Plus. Yes! Come on over. Hey, guys! <laughs> hey! Hey, hi. Welcome to the AC360 Google Plus page. I'm Maria Bartiromo at the New York Stock Exchange. Big shout out to all my friends on Google Plus. Hi, Data! Hey, Google Plus, how you doing? Hey, if you need another Google Plus friend, I'll be your friend. Okay. <laughs> I would like to introduce to you the car, the real thing. Welcome to the first Fox News Google Plus 2012 Hangout. This is an inaugural uh, broadcast. We are thrilled to have David Beckham with us. So our first question is, when are you coming to Ghana? I'd love an invitation, of course, which you've just given me. Welcome to the first ever presidential Google Plus Hangout. Over a quarter of a million people visited the White House YouTube channel and submitted their questions for you. Why does the government continue to issue H-1B visas when there are tons of Americans, just like my husband, with no job. We should get his resume, and I'll forward it to companies who say they cannot find somebody in that particular field. We will take the shot. Hey, y'all, what's up? This guy, DeMarcus Ware. I just want to tell you guys what's up. Thank y'all for being, you know, such great fans. Hi, DeMarcus. I'm Craig Stokes from Mobile, Alabama. Mobile, yeah. baby. That's right. You got any uh, superstitions or anything? Eddie is like the most superstitious guy I've ever met. Definitely uh, the magic of technology made it happen. And you can bring people in to be able to talk about the issues that are driving the day. We wanted to say thanks to everyone who is on our cyber couch today. And I will Google plus you. volunteer from the studio audience uh, to help us with a couple of things. One is, um, as we're going through these tools um, and campaigns over the next uh, 15 minutes, we'd like uh, for anybody to have, who has a contribution, an idea or something, you know, a tool or platform that you've used to sort of you know, raise your hand, let us know, and then somebody can write it down on the, on the whiteboard. Um, and also we need somebody, preferably the same person, who can volunteer to let us know when we're running out of time. Um, you know, we all usually speak for like hours on end, so we've only got five minutes per person, so when it's like four minutes, you know, raise your hand and the person will know to go into the home stretch of their talk. So can somebody do that for us? Or else, I'll, don't make me point you. Come on. You'll do it with me. Do you have a watch? Oh, my watch. All right. We were going to originally go to Sana next, but um, she wants to go. You want to go second? Okay, good. Uh, so we will instead go to uh, um, our Human Rights Watch folks. So, Jim, you want to come up here? For five minutes. <laughs> yeah, let me uh, get to the front page before we get the timer on, Jim. Uh, here it is. Oops. Here we are. So take it away, Jim. Right. Uh, my name is Jim Murphy. I work at Human Rights Watch. I'm the online editor there. Um, about four years ago, we started to devote some resources towards Facebook and Twitter. Um, after two years, we realized, hey, we have a pretty good amount of people following us, liking us on these platforms. And we just decided to do some social or some grassroots type campaigns. Um, and after three or four attempts, we found out that they, were, they really weren't working for us. Um, so we, we kind of regrouped, backtracked a little bit, um, refocused, and decided to look at some of our um, more traditional um, targets, which are our policymakers and journalists, 
Uh, we noticed we, we decided to focus on Twitter because policymakers had started to dip the toe in the water on Twitter and journalists had fully dove in at that point and were not only promoting themselves and aggregating news via Twitter, but also sourcing people um, on Twitter and getting into the media has always been one of our, our, our core goals. Um, and once we did that, you know, we did um, find some pretty quick successes. Um, by engaging staff, our executive director got very involved, um, and he turned out to be quite good at it. He realized that um, by, by kind of tweeting as news breaks, he could help to shape the story. Um, back in October when President Obama announced uh, he's going to be sending troops uh, into Uganda, you know, Ken Roth knew that was going to be a bit controversial and he was at an airport in Colombia and he immediately tweeted sort of the HRW position and helped frame that argument. Um, when it comes to our advocates, our advocates will use Twitter to kind of give it up or a down on based on how different Congress people are voting. And at one point, Senator Durbin's office contacted us asking us to retweet him. Um, so definitely, you know, conversations are going on on that platform. Um, in terms of the Arab Spring, being able to write in short form in Twitter and also on our website is crucial to getting into live blogs in the New York Times, BBC, The Guardian, um, and, you know, our stories and our tweets by our staff, not so much the institutional account. Um, it was those the personal accounts that have, you know, 100 to 1,000 followers, but our kind of key followers, um, regional specific, those are getting picked up in the mainstream media. Um, we identified that a couple of websites like Foreign Policy and NPR, which are critical to um, our audience that we're trying to target, uh, they'll have a most popular uh, box. And, you know, if we have an op-ed or, or someone who is interviewed on those sites, we target our social media fans to those pages. It will influence that most popular block. So we're kind of exerting um, some editorial power over these other websites, which is kind of a cool nuance. And that's from the main accounts that have you know, the more significant following. Um, another sort of good success story that just happened on Sunday, didn't make it into the deck. Um, Sunday at like 8 a.m., Pakistan tried to shut down Twitter. Um, our Pakistan researcher uh, just kind of mobilized everyone that he had been working with on Twitter, posted a quick blurb to the website, um, got colleagues at HRW asking the Pakistani government, what are you doing? Especially, what are you doing as NATO's about to meet in Chicago? Um, he was, at the same time, direct messaging influential policymakers, including the Prime Minister's daughter, Minister of the Interior. They were writing him back on direct message. They were also replying, you know, on Twitter, which is amplifying the whole story. And by 10, 10 p.m. that night, um, Twitter was back online in Pakistan. Um, and it was because, you know, our Pakistan researcher and other activists and journalists were all raising a, a ruckus on Twitter. And kind of most tellingly, these uh, policymakers announced that Twitter was back up online on Twitter. Um, you know, it was kind of the Prime Minister's daughter was saying, the Prime Minister has ordered the IT minister to restore Twitter service to Pakistan. And that was the official kind of notice that things were, were back online. Um, you, know, uh, sees, you know, having Ken Roth in foreign policies, top Twitterati is obviously a success story for us. Um, looking at, you know, some Twitter tips, I would say, like, go with, go with your strengths. You know, grassroots is not our strengths. We tried to go that route. It didn't really work out. But if it is your strength, you know, go with that. Um, in terms of messaging, you know, I still think you have to have that strong story. For us, it's been just sticking with news and facts because that's kind of what we're known for, what people expect from us. So we stay on point with that. Um, I have found that sometimes you want to tease, uh, tease the audience a little bit. The first question, you know, what country had 12,000 trials? You know, that was our, our most clicked uh, for the past six months. Um, sometimes I think we steer away from stats in our op-eds and our storytelling. We think people would be bored by it, but on Twitter, stats seem to do well, especially if you're comparing one country to another. Um, and I'll just wrap up with some of the challenges we face. Um, social media, you know, we, we started without adding any additional resources, um, and so it's hard to keep up. Um, it's some of these social media companies don't always provide like a very easy mechanism to respond to them with human rights concerns and um, in trying to find the time to train staff and invest in the training that's necessary to really you know break out of the institutional mode and mobilize all of your your coworkers is also a challenge so I'll stop there Okay, they're like parting in. 
Uh, so Salim, uh, sorry, Sana Salim, uh, why don't you come on up and tell us about your organization um, and how you're using uh, mostly Twitter? All right, come up to the mic. <clears throat> and you're on the clock. Um, hi, my name is Sana Salim, and I'm from Pakistan. I work for uh, an advocacy and policy group called Bolopi, which means speak up. And um, i like to just take a step back from what we're talking about so far, uh, about tools and how the tools are used, and focus more on the strategy. Um, I do feel that with a lot of conversation going on with social media and tools, unfortunately, a lot of focus is on tools themselves and not the main uh, driving force behind it, the people. Um, Tools are great. It's amazing the kind of access that Twitter has been able to provide, G+, and as well as Facebook, but they're as good as, as we make use of it. So I do feel that because of what Evgeny Morozov refers to as cyber utopia, we tend to underestimate the need for a proper strategy and dive into the social media world thinking that anything and everything is going to work. Um, so I'll just focus on one of the campaigns that we did recently and the ways in which we... Uh, you sort of uh, use different tools to amplify it. Um, firstly, uh, the, just to give you a background of the, the campaign that I'll be talking about, is in February, on February 22nd, uh, the government of Pakistan announced for a call for proposal for international surveillance companies and local uh, academics to make an indigenous or an international system for filtering the web, more of a replica for the uh, firewall of China in Pakistan. Um, it was an open call on a newspaper. Um, firstly, our, our initial reaction was that this is an unprecedented case. Governments around the world use surveillance technology and uh, URL filtering and blocking technology, but never have they called uh, on an open call. Uh, so our first reaction was how we were going to go about it. And um, we've been working in um, internet freedom and advocacy for a long time, and we did that previously as well with Facebook ban, and we saw the kind of reaction that came from the government. Um, this time, we were much wiser. Uh, so initially, our initial reaction was that we're not going to have a knee-jerk reaction to this. Uh, obviously, it's a grievous issue, but we are going to contact uh, the government, something that the advocacy groups avoid doing, make first contact with the government before going uh, on an all-out campaign, which uh, we found was a very effective strategy because as activists, we tend to become more reactive. And as we do that, uh, we put the governments or the authorities in a defensive position, which makes it harder for us to, uh, you know, sort of advocate for what we are doing. So our first, rea our first principle was to avoid knee-jerk reaction, and we wrote to the government telling them that we need more transparency in the process that you've, uh, you've sort of uh, pulled out. We need to understand what, uh, what stakeholders uh, were contacted. We need to understand if you even uh, if you even know or if you even can comprehend the kind of implication such a system has if it was ever um, uh, implemented. Uh, and we waited, of course, for a 24-hour period uh, for the government to respond. And only then we made our first contact with with the press. Um, the second most important thing that we did, which we felt that is important to replicate in other uh, advocacy campaigns, is that the need to collaborate not only with civil society organizations working within uh, the local community, but also with various stakeholders outside of it. So what we did initially was that a lot of times, most of the times, most of the countries, and this is not just limited to authoritarian regimes, is um, activists are automatically blacklisted. Uh, anything that the activists say is sort of shelved out by the government and, and sort of, if I may say, filtered out by them. So for this campaign particularly, we contacted academics and we said, this is the implication of such a system on research in academia. We want you to please write to the government, uh, the Ministry of Education and any or any relevant authorities and uh, tell, inform them of, of the implications of such a system. Um, and we spoke to businesses. Uh, we had Pakistan Software Housing uh, Association, Houses Association, which has around over 400 software uh, companies registered, to speak to software houses and to speak to businesses, and that who that could speak to Chamber of Commerce or the government about the implication of such a system. And similarly, we did this with media uh, groups and um, other stakeholders that could be affected. Um, 
And at the same time, we engaged with activists who, uh, who call themselves activists, but who believe, uh, one minute left. Oh, sorry. Uh, we engaged with activists who were promoting uh, the ban. Um, I'll have to like move. move. Uh, I'll have to speed up this. Um, and oh, the other strategy that we had was we said we felt that we need to focus on facts and public education. Uh, what we did was we devised. Uh, we got experts uh, in technology or security and as well as freedom of expression to, con to crowdsource and contribute to a press kit, which was a very simple FAQ uh, onto our website and sent it to leading columnists or reporters that we know to try to educate them and to promote uh, sort of uh, a more informed debate in the media about this, something that JD was saying that integrating social media into mainstream media. Um, and oh, we used uh, videos for uh, spreading our message. Uh, we spoke to Business Human Rights Center to talk about the implication of uh, such uh, surveillance technology and how international surveillance companies are playing a vital role. Uh, on the, this, uh, on the left side, you see um, the member of the National Assembly, Bushra Ghar, who we spoke to uh, about this uh, campaign. Uh, at, the, what, at the moment, what has happened is uh, that we've uh, been able to get the government to make a verbal commitment that they will not be uh, uh, buying this technology. And at the same time, we also have a legal stay, interim stay order on, uh, on buying of, on censoring of any, uh, any form, whether with this technology or not. Um, what the point about with the case study is that I feel that even though it's important to engage and to have all of this social media technology involved, it's also very important to know what, what, what uh, stakeholders to contact and what other uh, areas to tap into in order to strengthen the campaign, in order to deliver what uh, a proper uh, substantial end goal. Thank you, Sam. And thank you for coming all the way out from Pakistan for this. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now we're going to go to Oscar. So get ready, Oscar. Um, Dorsey, you're last. <laughs> and uh, we have never run a Prezi uh, presentation off my computer before, so this will be interesting. Uh, let me sort of... Uh, Hide my doc. Uh, by the way, the first time I ever heard of Oscar Morales was when I was reading um, da David Kirkpatrick's book, uh, The Facebook Effect, and Oscar was there on page one. Um, and I thought it was a really great example of, of, of uh, advocacy using Facebook. So why don't you tell us about that? And if, if you can't get this to work, let me know. Give it a shot. Okay, let me put this chronometer. Perfect. And then full screen. Okay. Um, this was a campaign uh, that happened in Colombia four years ago, in February 2008. And since then, uh, well, in that time, it became like the first time Facebook was used to mobilize and rally people in a massive, massive scale. And then I'll, let me show you the, the, the presentation will speak by itself. So we started, and this is in a Spanish word, and it means no, no more kidnapping, no more lies. No more deaths, no more FARC. FARC is a terrorist organization that has been attacking Colombia for the last 46 years. It's amazing how in so long time we haven't been able to get rid of them. So this proves the participation of civil society, a problem that is a, a, a national problem now. Civil society had always been apart from the solution of this, and this was like a first time in First time that we did that from civil society. So in summary, it happened on February 4th, 2008. In 200 cities, we were able to do that using the power of social media to reach to 200 cities across the world using Facebook with this amount of people. And this is important to show how Facebook, apart from the buzz, apart, apart from the magic that happens online, provides you human resources. And for any campaign, when you don't have any money, this is quite important that we got volunteers, 350,000 mem 150, members, 2,000 collaborators, 200 coordinators in each city, and a central committee of five organizers. Nov nobody of us, let me go back here, knew each other before February 4th. We were completely strangers, and that's another magic of social media, how it integrates people that just have the same interests, but they don't 
have any other relationship apart from having a profile on a social network. We did that this in a month. We had two million marchers, 12, excuse me, 12 million marchers in all five continents, 40 countries into 100 cities. So let's see what happened. So first of all, this, this is like a context so you can understand what happened and why it happened. So we did it because this is FARC. I won't speak here, just show what these bastards are doing to us. No, really, uh, they are actually one week ago, a bomb exploded in the center of Bogota, it was hell. So this is what happens, they have kids as soldiers, as you can see, they have the power to hijack planes, to destroy entire towns, as you can see in this. I'm just showing just uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg of what they've been doing to us in the last four, four, four decades. And until we said no more, that's it. And when you talk about movements, you really talk about how society can participate in the solution of, of something that seems like the task for a president or for a government, not necessarily. So uh, this is how we did it. It all started as a simple Facebook group. Well, this is the picture of the page. But four years ago, it was just group. Pages in 2008 didn't exist. So what happened is that the timing was right, the message was right, the picture was right. Everything we published in the first days was what people wanted to hear. And people wanted to connect with the message. So it suddenly went viral. I wish I could explain how to make this thing go viral because it's really the secret of the news feed and combining all these tools, how you can, you can get a, a lot of attention. So once it went viral, then everything explains by itself. We doubled membership, we grew a lot of people in just one week. In one month we have like a, a quarter of a million. And this is very important. Digitally movements, digitally fueled movements are not uh, good on their own. They need to connect with reality. So they need to propose real-time activities. So our you know, simple solution was we propose a protest using all this power, and it went big. <clears throat> and then this is something really particular for a specific place like Colombia. Like what happened here only happens there. It doesn't happen in the U.S. because you have a different cultural standards. So when you ask somebody for tips, not necessarily those tips would apply to a certain place. So in Colombia, for example, Latin culture, very, very, uh, I would say, relaxed. We do whatever we want in the street. So we can sell T-shirts on the stop, on the red signs. We can uh, use our billboards all across. So we had this. This is what one of the things that really amazed me. The, how do I... Okay. <laughs> so we even had a donation of billboards that were donated. Time is up. Oh, sorry. Okay. I have one more, two more minutes. So there was a lot of frenzy. Reset. There was a lot of frenzy, but I want to point out here how important it is to engage with traditional media. Radio join, TV network join, a lot of people join. I mean, you can see that. I, I don't need to read. But you know what? If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have gone anywhere. Traditional media is fundamental. The same thing happened in Tunisia. I want to remember, uh, let you know, when Tunisia started in January, in December 2009, excuse me, 10, and then in January 2011, it was only, only when Al Jazeera joined. It was when real, real Tunisian and Egyptian movement saw the light all across America and Europe. So it's very important that you try to get engaged with at least one powerful network that can back your cause. So once we had that, then this is the, the juicy part. Uh, you've seen all kinds of tools. This is when JD was talking about having a presence in different networks, but also choosing the networks that work for your country, specific country. In our case, why Facebook? It had 9 million users. It was the top one. Why Gmail? because it was better than Hotmail at that time. You know, Gmail was like the new kid on the block. Why Skype? It didn't ex we didn't have Google Hangouts at that time. So what you do is that you pick the platform that you need in order to get the result done. So you know what? In YouTube, we appreciate a lot what YouTube did for us, for our cause, because, you know, we had this terrorist organization. Everybody knew it was there. But there comes a moment when you see just one video and that video will make you go to the protest. Will, that's the moment when you say, you know what? 
what the hell, I'm going to go. I can't stand this. I will participate. When you make that decision, that's what you want. That's what YouTube will do for you if you're smart. So in YouTube, we also posted all the coverage that we were having from media. We use database to collect information. This is very important. At that time, we could use MySQL. We could use Google Maps to point and sack protest locations. There are so many tools that are just so natural at that moment. I mean, it's just a natural thing to do. And then the covers from other bloggers. We had debates, not only publicity on TV, which is a different thing. One thing is to have a, like a one-minute note on a, on a news emission on 7 a.m., 7 p.m., whatever. But it's better if you have a talk show where for 20 minutes you can convince people to go and have a lot of time to explain your cause. So, and Facebook, uh, Mott. 100% of our human resources. We didn't have to pay any single money to anyone to do things for us. Everything was volunteer, was free, and it happened because of Facebook. And then it happened. This is the result. I've been talking a lot about what happened, but then the pictures will show what happened. I mean, it was amazing for us to witness this amazing mobilization against a band of terrorists. And it happened in 200 cities we have here in Europe, translated into 17 different languages. This is Plaza Mayor in Madrid. For those of you who have been there, this is very symbolic. And how oh, this is amazing. This is an acronym that was made in Caracas. 900 people were underneath that, those signs. So it took a lot of logistic. I was told that later. I wasn't there. I was in Barranquilla, Colombia. This was how a logo can be spread. So if you are just simple, you know, some people spent so many thousands of dollars designing the logo. I did this in five minutes, and it worked. I mean, sometimes people are, movement leaders just think too much corporate sometimes. And then the simple answer is just right there in your nose. And, okay, pictures and more pictures and more pictures with amazing, amazing manifestation of what, what, what society is doing now in the, for the cause. I mean, they are doing everything. They are marching for us. They are advocating with us. And... It became the largest demonstration in our country's history, probably the you know, uh, largest demonstration in history. But what we're doing right now is that we need to mentor. So after this, we decided to create a lot of networks. So we had Alliance of Youth Movements, now movements that are, that is represented here, and cyber dissidents. Now efforts are coming together in order to teach other leaders of causes to do this to mobilize. So we connect this with Egypt and Tunisia and many other examples that will be happening for the next decade. Now the technology is among us and we're using it the best that we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. <clears throat> it's really fascinating. And Oscar, you're going to be joining Jim in the Facebook circle, right, in a few minutes. Cool. Um, fantastic follow-on to follow-on from, uh, from that presentation. So I work for an or organisation, an NGO called the Global Poverty Project. It's a bit of a mouthful. And um, basically we, we're an educational and campaigning organisation for developed countries. We don't work in developing countries. We aim to increase the number and effectiveness of people taking action to see an end to extreme poverty. That's kind of our mandate. Um, and this is an organisation that started many years ago, and what we've learned is that any actions, even just small actions, multiplied by lots of people, can and will create big change. And there's no better example than to follow on from uh, your example in Colombia. So the Global Poverty Project is an organisation for developed countries, and it's about celebrating the things that do make a big difference. Now, social media-wise, this is where we have to utilise social media to, to be able to transport the the topics and issues of extreme poverty back into those developed countries. We do that through campaigns and educational tools and also a, uh, a whiz-bang presentation that we call 1.4 Billion Reasons. And in that presentation, we kind of go through the topics and issues and we dismantle it down and we deliver a positive message. People have had enough of being hit with a moral bat and uh, you know, guilt-tripped and saddened and asked for money. We're purely about good news stories that make a big difference so that people can feel empowered and take action. And using social media is fantastic on so many different realms for us. It's either engaging people into that movement or it's giving them an opportunity to take action and implement it, you know, even on a small scale with social media. 
One of the, the newer technologies that we've been using is Google+, and in particular, the live Hangouts on Air. Now, this represented a significant opportunity for us as an organisation. Previously, to book a presentation is a pain in the ass. <laughs> it takes a host, a dedicated host. It takes a location. It takes people to, to come out to it. It takes um, you know, the audio-visual, make sure everything's set up, etc. And so by Google Plus Hangouts, anyone from anywhere that has access to the internet can, can, can see your presentation. And so it, take, it gets rid of all of that. So you can watch it from home, from your own comfy couch, and be inspired and get information about how to end extreme poverty. So Google Plus, we, we presented around uh, the Live Below the Line campaign that we run. And it was a huge success. We had over 180 people tapping in from who knows where. I haven't actually done the statistical analysis of it yet. Tapping in and then also interacting with up to 10 people from around the world who had really country-specific information for us. And so it was still that live interactive presentation that we give when we're here in person. So back to the, to the issue. It's 1.4 billion people who live in extreme poverty. That's living on less than $1.25 US per day. Um, and then there's one person. It's pretty scary. Where do you start? What do you do? Well, the Global Poverty Projects, we offer up a number of different ways that people can take action. You know, everyone just sort of thinks, oh, yep, I'll give 20 bucks and uh, I'm, I'm good for next week until someone else hassles me. But we, we like to get people involved in a bunch of different ways, and particularly to follow, you know, your own passions and interests, following your heart and your head. You know, follow the topics and issues that you care about and do it in a really informed and inspiring and meaningful way. So the one action I want to talk about of those six is to shout. And this is where we make a difference not just for ourselves and to take action, but where we encompass other people around us to join that movement as well. Social media is a fantastic tool for us to be able to shout. And we all, we all do that. Oh, wow, that looks really interesting. Like, you know, the dog balancing a budgie. Or, <laughs> you probably don't know what a budgie is, sorry. Dog balancing a bird. Or, you know, hey, look, there's this great resource on how we can end corruption from Transparency International or something like that. So all we are is sort of a vessel where people can, who kind of care and want to take action with the people who are taking action and bridge them across. And social media is a critical tool for us to do that. Um, we we utilise all different realms of social media, as we've heard about here today, um, and it's important to use all those different kinds. They all have a different place uh, in society and, and the way that you utilise them. And that's the fantastic thing about this kind of session is to work out the nuances of each one of those. The, the one uh, that we, we love, of course, is, is our Facebook. Um, and this is an, an example of our youth action page. So this was actions from youth or young people for young people. So they could take an action, they could post it, and it gets thrown up on our website, gets thrown up on their Facebook page, and other people can see that and then take action based on that. So it's this beautiful ripple effect that I think um, that, that social media has. That ripple effect shouldn't be underestimated. Going back to this, this relatively new realm of social media is Google+. Now, Google+, Plus is something that we've only learned about quite recently, but we, the value that we see in it is phenomenal. Cool. Uh, and that's around, you know, the Hangouts on Air. I explained about that before, how we can give presentations anywhere around the world. It goes up on our web page, it goes up on YouTube, it goes up on our Google Plus page. You don't have to sign up, you don't have to sign in, you don't have to, you know, swipe your finger print 18 times to get into this stuff. It's there and ready and accessible. Um, the other thing it does is it can be recorded. So something fantastic or significant, we can grab that chunk from a presentation. And I've been continually inspired by 10 to 17 year olds who, who hear the presentation and then go out and change the world. And being able to celebrate that with the world is a fantastic addition to, to this tool. Uh, circles, you can really pinpoint who you're trying to encompass. It could be demographically, it could be geographically, or you know, a mixture of all those sorts of things. So you can really nestle in and be specific with your message and your meaning. Uh, the plus one function, again, is, is similar to, to likes, but in this case, it makes a big difference to us as an organisation because we can see who's, who's liking us, how we're going to monitor our, our work and what we do, and how we you know, fit them into future circles. The other thing that uh, Jason touched on before is Google Plus and its function in search. So by doing a Google search, we, I mean, we don't even say, oh, I need to search that up somewhere in a book. We say, I'm going to Google it. Like, it's so common. And to now be able to combine Google Plus with that function 
so they can see real-time updates of us. You know, here's a post on ending polio. Here's a post on live below the line. All the different campaigns that we run. You, you're connecting the dots in a much faster way. So you're jumping the dots. They don't have to go to your web page, click through 18 pages. It's like bang, straight onto a campaign. So, so I'd, I'd encourage that one. And then you can, you can take ownership of, of the way that the Google search function is working. And it's certainly an area that Jason uh, will, be, will be covering in our breakout session as well. Now, not all of our successes, not, it's not all been successes. We did have a Facebook app for young people. It kind of crashed and burnt. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't shove their head in it, so to speak. So it's a bit coarse. But <laughs> what I'm saying is it's trial and error, and you certainly, lose, uh, you certainly learn from your, your errors. A, a significant win that we did have, it's not quite on the scale of, of your win, but for us as an organisation, it was huge. We, we're looking at eradicating polio off the face of the earth. We're down to the last 1% of polio cases around the world. So we combined our social media with a concert for 6,000 people, and we lobbied government at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth last year. Pretty significant, all those sorts of things. But that amount of pressure from all different angles, traditional media, social media, concerts, meeting government and combining it together created $118 million of extra funding towards the global eradication of polio. I mean, that's, that's more than just sort of, oh, here's a bit of change. So, well, a big change in the, in the big scale of things. We're doing this again this year. We're heading across, I'm um, personally heading across Canada to try, and, to try and get people behind this movement to see the second uh, human disease ever to be wiped, wiped off the face of the earth since smallpox. And now with Google Plus at our, at our realm, we think that it's going to be a huge success. So that's sort of the practical application of social media for social justice. And that's what I'll be talking about in, uh, in my session. Thanks. Thank you, Darius. Great. Can I get back in? Uh, yes. Let's do that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now we're going to do the fun part. Let's see if this is going to work or not. Um, we're going to do breakout sessions. So um, we, uh, I think all four of us ran over time, so we only have like a half hour left, all right? So we're going to do one uh, breakout session instead of two. All right, great. Uh, so three things to wrap up. Um, remember your homework, guys, right? So socialbright.org slash advocacy toolkit. You will see all of these flyers online with these informational guides on advocacy campaigns, how to run a campaign, social media hubs, uh, monitoring tools, free metrics tools, hashtags, social fundraising, all that good jazz. And then if you click over to the next tab on resources, uh, uh, let us know if there are any organizations that you guys work with or, you know, if you guys yourselves want to be added to this, if you work with other organizations. So platforms for activism, uh, resources around e-campaigning, um, organizations that enable activism, uh, uh, witness.org sent us a whole bunch of links from their side on advocacy videos. So I haven't seen anybody else on the web do this. So this is really cool, this new toolkit. So uh, please contribute to it, make use of it. Um, come on up, take advantage of these free handouts that are on this table, and, uh, and let's continue the conversation over the next two days. And uh, please help us move the tables back too. So thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>